Okay, button shift. Hey, hi everyone. Welcome to the Industrial Problem Seminar. It's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Morteza Mardani. He's a senior researcher at NVIDIA Research uh, at the Generative AI Group. Uh, he graduated from the University of Minnesota in 2015. Professor Yorgos Giannakis was his advisor. Uh, since then, he also had a um, postdoc position at Stanford and visiting a scholarship at uh, Berkeley. Um, he's still a visiting scholar at the, the E department at Stanford, and he works uh, in various areas of uh, large-scale uh, machine learning, in particular generative AI. Uh, one of his prizes includes the Young Author Best Paper Award from uh, IEEE Signal Processing Society in uh, 2017. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Madani is going to talk about sampling diffusion models in the era of generative AI. All right, sounds great. Hello, everyone, and thanks, Gilad, for the introduction. It's a great pleasure, actually, to be back to Minnesota. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it in person, but at least I can actually interact with audience from Minnesota remotely. So uh, so when actually Gilad approached me to give a talk, so I asked myself what to present at IMA. So IMA used to have very good workshops in theory and fundamentals back in the day when I was there, especially in optimization and compressing, compressive sampling, which actually I benefited a lot. I learned a lot from those. Those opened my eyes. So it's almost 10 years from then. Things have changed a lot. It's actually the time of AI, in the era of generative AI. And I would like to actually talk about uh, some research stuff that we, about Gen AI, but I also want to be faithful with, uh, you know, like the, the goal of IMA. And I wanted to talk about sampling stuff, actually, for generative AI, um, especially with diffusion models. So let me actually begin with the, with a quote with, from our uh, CEO, Jensen Huang, about generative AI, that uh, in the future, the content will not be retrieved, but would be generated for each individual. So the content retrieval, retrieval is actually switching. You know, like there is a paradigm shift that it's actually switching from retrieval to, to generation, to content generation. So I'm pretty sure Everybody in this room has been amazed by the power of generative AI, especially language models like GPT-4. Um, but uh, generation is not only for language. It's not only text-based. There are other important modalities. Vision is uh, one of those uh, actually very important modalities. And uh, it seems that uh, you know generative diffusion models, particularly, are very powerful and actually have been very successful for uh, vision, especially for text to image generation models. If you, I'm pretty sure you have seen models like a stable diffusion that do text to image generation or Dolly two, you know, a few days ago Dolly three came out from Open uh, AI and Edify actually, which came out a couple of years ago from Nvidia. So that's why actually I want to focus on diffusion models in this talk. So, but before I delve into diffusion models and give you kind of an introduction and some technical details about diffusion models, let's actually uh, see what's the problem of uh, generative learning, especially deep generative learning. So because diffusion models are just a class of deep generative learning models. So the problem of deep generative learning in general deals with learning distributions of data from a finite number of samples. We don't have like infinitely many samples. We have some data sets like ImageNet or we have data from the internet. So in principle, it's a density estimation problem. So, but a lot of cases actually, we don't care about how the density looks. We don't need to get the probability density function, which is high dimensional and very complex to sample from. We just need a neural network to be able to sample from them. So the neural network doing sampling is actually good enough for us, you know, to, to generate sample from the distribution and use it for different tasks. 
So the landscape of deep generative learning has changed a lot uh, over the last, I would say, maybe 20, 30 years. You know, starting from Bayesian network and uh, restricted Bootsman machines uh, back in the day in in 90s to, you know, like to early 2000, where variational autoencoders and normalizing flows came into uh, you know, picture, and more recently that actually GANs, Generative Adversarial Network, showed a lot of great promises, which is kind of considered as the first big bang. And now it's actually time for diffusion model, which is, uh, you know, thought to be the second big bang and a bigger big bang actually in, in generative learning. So I'm saying this uh, for a fact based on the data, for example, if you can, uh, look at the statistics of uh, the publications or papers that have been, you know, in in uh, machine learning conferences. I chose CVPR, which is a, uh, you know, well recognized computer vision plus machine learning conference. And uh, you know, if we look at the papers over the years, there's been a peak at around 2018 for GANs, and now it's been the time for for diffusions. Diffusions are actually have been uh, the number of papers quite increasing over the years. But this data, this actually plot at least, is, is not the most accurate one. It could be biased, but it suggests that, you know, the, the time is is to be coming, you know, maybe in a couple of years, that would be a high point for diffusion models. So, uh, so I think uh, we have enough motivations now by generative learning, about generative learning and diffusions. So let's see the roadmap for the rest of the talk. So in this space of generative AI and generative learning, I'm gonna tell you first uh, about uh, where NVIDIA stand in this business. What is the role of NVIDIA here? And then I'm gonna give you, you know, like uh, introduction, something, you know, like modeling uh, details about denoising diffusion models in particular. And then I'm going to talk about uh, how to sample from diffusion models under the constraint. This is where, actually, I told you I want to be faithful to the mission of IMA and and you know talk about uh, fundamentals and you know things related to sampling that we have in all this. So, but with modern tools and techniques. So um, about you know the role of NVIDIA. You know, like many of you in the room may think that NVIDIA is a hard hardware company. But that's actually not true. Indeed, the business model for NVIDIA focuses a lot on the software. And in particular, in the case of uh, generative AI, actually, it's, it's very challenging for software companies, for software makers to add generative AI to their application. Generative AI is pretty challenging because uh, the models for generative AI are not easy to develop and to deploy. And the first reason being, they require a lot of data. You know, Chat GPT, for example, uh, crawls on the web and collects uh, a lot of data over the internet. It actually, billions of uh, samples or stable diffusion uses actually, for example, five billion samples. You know, all image caption pairs over the internet. So that's a huge scale. So cleaning that data and uh, preparing and curating that data is actually very challenging. So this second uh, challenge actually is the inference. Inference uh, for generative AI is, is actually is pretty compute intensive and it's, it's usually very complex to scale up and also to set up. So the third thing actually being that the companies want to run their models uh, that are customized to their you know, characteristics, to their own data, to their, uh, you know, and because of the cor corporate sensitivities, and to do all these three, you would need AI expertise and uh, uh, and also the large computing infrastructure. So that's where actually NVIDIA is trying to create an ecosystem for generative AI that can do from software to compute, can do the whole stack, the full stack. So let me focus uh, more specifically on custom models. So uh, specifically, NVIDIA has a focus on 
you know, building a foundation model, customized foundation models uh, that they work in a multimodal fashion. For example, they can get different data sources like text, image, speech, 3D and structured data, and they can output, you know, different other modalities for different downstream tasks. So, and uh, specifically about foundation models, uh, in last year at the GTC conference, which is an NVIDIA conference, in last March, they announced uh, AI foundations, which is a foundry for building uh, custom AI models. So it's a cloud service, essentially, that uh, helps customers to build, refine, and operate actually generative AI models, uh, which have been trained based on their own data and domain-specific tasks. So the foundation models that they have is actually doing different, different tasks. So there is NEMO, which is used for language. It's a service for generating large language model. And BioNEMO is a, is a biology version of that language, which is for protein uh, you know, unfolding and drug discovery. And there is also the visual language models. There's actually Picasso. Uh, model where all these services actually will run, will run on the NVIDIA DGX cloud that, that are using actually G, uh, using GPUs and that's been through a partnership with Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud and Oracle. So let me actually give a little bit more specifics about for example the visual language model, foundation model uh, or uh, Picasso which is a foundry for uh, custom generative AI models for, for visual design. It can do text to image generations, and it can actually do text to video and also text to 3D. All these actually are uh, relying on diffusion models. So diffusion model is a very important, uh, you know, part and component for the products uh, that actually NVIDIA delivers through the DG, NVIDIA DGX Cloud. So, yeah, I think that was... Uh, at least a good, uh, you know, like a uh, source of information for where is the role of in media in this business. But now actually let me give you, uh, you know, like a little bit more technical details about diffusion models. We can actually now dig into diffusion models a little bit. So by the way, if there is any questions, you can actually uh, interrupt me and ask questions, by, you know, like over chat or, Whatever. So, uh, so the denoising diffusion models are based on principle of denoising. So, where the denoising diffusion models actually they they consist of two, two processes. There is the forward process, which is the noising process. Actually, that's the easy process. We can keep adding gradually noise to the signal or to the data until it gets completely lost in the noise. And then there is a reverse process, actually, which is a which is the challenging process, which is the reconstruction or inversion process, which wants to generate the data or generate samples from the distribution by starting from pure noise and doing the noise in gradual. So more formally, you can think of the forward model. Think you start from the X0, which is the ground truth. This is in the actual training phase because in the sampling phase, we don't have access to the ground truth. And then you can keep gradually adding Gaussian noise with, with very small variance until, you know, at iteration capital T, we have pure noise. So this is essentially a Markov process because it's uh, the noise is added recursively at each time step. Uh, to the previous, you know, the noisy signal. So it's an easy Markov process, uh, which has Gaussian distribution. And as a result of that, the joint distribution is actually very easy to compute because we know the transition probabilities. So the forward process also, actually we can write it in a more compact form through a diffusion kernel. This diffusion kernel interpretation is actually interesting and useful later. So essentially we can go directly from the X0, which is the, you know, the ground truth data to one of the, you know, like let's say X4, for example, you know, to time T. So we can directly add noise, you know, uh, to get there, 
because the process is simple actually and Gaussian is a binary process. So then um, if the intensity of noise at, you know, or the variance of the noise at each iteration is beta of t, then we can actually easily get another, you know, Gaussian distribution for x t given x zero, which we call this the diffusion kernel. So, and the model that uh, we get, let's say x t, depend, uh, you know, like uh, relative to x zero, which is the original, you know, the image original signal, is just a simple linear model you know, xt, which is weighted sum of x0 and noise. So epsilon here is the noise, the noise realization that we add each time. So, and we choose this uh, alpha bar t, which is the intensity of uh, signal or noise per time, so that eventually alpha bar becomes zero, so we have pure noise. So I want you to remember this equation, this very simple linear equation for the rest of the talk. This is actually uh, the takeaway that you can get from the four-part diffusion model. It's a very simple, observation model, which you have observation xt, which is noisy version of x0 that we don't know, or, or in the case of training is the original signal. So um, the diffusion kernel also can help us to sample from the diffuse distribution. So we are interested to get the distribution of q of xt, uh, not necessarily the conditional distribution, which was the easy Gaussian one. The Q of XT, which is a diffuse data distribution, we can actually see it through this integration. And actually, that's pretty complicated. It's because if you think about it, we start from data, original data, which has usually a very multimodal distribution, like Q of X0. And then we gradually add noise, uh, you know, such that the diffuse data distribution converges to Gaussian. So we can uh, think of this diffusion kernel as a Gaussian convolution, meaning that at each time step, we just do a convolution so that the multimodal signal eventually turns to uh, Gaussian noise, to a Gaussian distribution. So, so, so we wanted to sample from Q of XT. Now, actually, sampling from Q of XT, if you look at this integration, is is very easy because we we can sample from Q of XT given X zero, and then sample from uh, Q of X0 through ancestral sampling. So, so we have, even though we don't know this distribution Q of XT, it's very complicated, but we can sample from it, so it's easy. So now let's uh, look at the reverse process, which is actually the difficult process. So if you look at the diffused trajectory, how the, the distribution changes from step to a step until it becomes noise, the goal of the, you know, the reverse process is to, uh, to, 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 re to reverse this task, to go from Gaussian to XT. But this is challenging because we would need to sample from XT minus one given XT. This is, this is not Markov anymore. This is not Gaussian anymore. This is actually indeed very intractable and complicated. So that you can think of it, if the forward was convolution, this is like a deconvolution, which is a difficult task. So this is intractable, but, uh, Denoising diffusion models, that's where actually the, the term denoising comes from, is that um, they as resort to an approximation. And the approximation is that Q of XT minus X, XT minus one given XT has a normal distribution. If the noise that we add at each time step, it's, it's, it's very tiny, it's very small. So of course this comes at a cost. You cannot take bigger steps. You gotta be very careful and take very tiny steps in each step of the forward process, so that in the reverse process, this approximation would make sense. So, yeah, so denoising diffusion models are based on this assumption, based on this Gaussian assumption. And uh, if we make this Gaussian assumption, of course, we don't know the mean of this uh, distribution. We just assume it's Gaussian. And we know the variance of that because we know variance of the noise that we add in the forward process but we don't know actually the mean because the reverse process is going through different uh, nonlinear steps, noise gets correlated. So, and then what happens is that uh, in we, we parameterized um, the mean of this xt minus one given xt with a neural network. So the parameters are in theta. And then 
we typically use uh, neural networks like UNET or denoising autoencoders to to learn this this mu theta. This mu theta is is the output of a denoiser in 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 principle. Actually, I'll clarify that further in the in the next couple of slides. So you can think it think of it as a denoiser which tries to uh, you know remove the noise and give the clean signal. That's the clean estimate of the signal. So so if we know if we make this approximation with this Gaussian model, then we can form the joint distribution again easily. And if we have the joint distribution, then we can do the training because we can always maximize the likelihood, which is actually this term. Of course, uh, as in the case of variational autoencoders or in case of variational methods, maximizing the likelihood is, is intractable because we don't know Q of X0, which is where we want to take expectation for. And then people typically use a variational upper bound, which is called the elbow upper bound. And then, uh, you know, like we can also parameterize the, the mean of the Gaussian that I was telling you about, uh, which is the clean signal as a, a subtraction of the original signal minus the estimate of the noise. So that we can put the parameteriz parameterization into the, into the prediction or estimation of the noise, pure noise. So, which is epsilon theta. Since epsilon theta is going to predict epsilon, ideally it would actually give epsilon back that Gaussian noise that we have added in the forward process so that this becomes uh, purely the ground truth signal. Of course, it's, it's very challenging to get uh, the epsilon back. Uh, so, but if we put these uh, pieces together, the training strategy is actually very simple if you look at, look at it look at it, so for denoising diffusion models. We just get the, you know, the parameterization for noise. The, let's say that's a neural network and we get the ground truth data or the training data that we have and keep adding noise at different levels. And we, we wanna denoise. So we just wanna train the weights of, let's say if this data is a neural network so that it can work at all noise levels and at all time steps and for, all uh, or averaged out over all input or data distribution. So it's a simple, it's a very simple denoising task. A very simple like denoiser that we wanted to work for all time step and for all noise levels. So if you think about it, this is a very simple quadratic form. It's just denoising. So it's a very simple denoising. So I want you to keep this in mind. So for the rest of the talk, but there is a term here, this epsilon theta, that actually that I told you, which is a prediction for the noise, has a very interesting interpretation. This is actually the score function. It's called the score function. So the score function is just predicting the noise. And uh, if in the continuous case, uh, this has an interpretation in terms of a stochastic differential equation. So one can think of like, if we make the time steps of the diffusion process that we gradually add noise, it's very small. If they go to like to zero, if they, in the limit, then in the continuous case, then the discretization that we had for the diffusion model can be expressed expressed as a stochastic differential equation, which is actually a very simple uh, SDE with the Wiener process as the noise and a very simple, actually linear drift function. But the very interesting, actually, property of this forward SDE is that it has a nice and simple uh, backward solution. So that means that we can go backward by changing just the drift function. So, and then the drift function is updated uh, or subtracted actually with another term, which is the gradient of log of, uh, you know, data. Q, remember Q of XT was the original data distribution or the training data distribution that we keep adding noise to that at different uh, time steps. So, and this gradient of log probability is actually the score function, which is epsilon theta, which is a scaled version. There is a scaling actually that we need to add, but it's, it's just, you can think of it as epsilon theta. So, so epsilon theta was the score function. Then, so, yeah, so then uh, it has connections with SDEs and then we can actually interpret it as uh, SDEs and it works 
for continuous case as well. So that that's that, that was a point that I was trying to make with this continuous uh, with ST is that uh, denoising diffusion models actually in the continuous case become STs and they they generalize to continuous case too. So if you put actually all pieces together. As I told you, the training strategy is very simple. It's just like learning a denoiser, you know, for different noise levels and uh, different time steps uh, by by just using gradient descent. And then the sampling strategy, if there is no constraint, if uh, in a simplest case we can use MCMC based ideas or Langevin dynamics actually to sample from uh, this epsilon theta. So the whole point that I'm trying to make here is that a training algorithm just learns a score function epsilon theta. That's all you need. And in the sampling phase, you just need a score function, nothing else actually. So if you give me the score function, then I can use Langevin dynamics or MCMC based methods to sample from it. So of course, this sampling strategy is uh, for scenarios that there is no constraints. There is, there is, we don't have any requirements. Like we just want to sample, you know, for example, for text to image diff diffusion models. We just want to give a text prompt and sample from it. So that's the motivation for the, actually uh, the next part of the talk. And, uh, and that's where actually I uh, would like to, uh, you know, connect uh, diffusion models to, to sampling. And, and they'll actually more into sampling. So, yeah, so in, as I said, you know, the previous sampler, the MCMC based samplers or Langevin dynamic samplers, they could uh, work if there is no constraints. But if there is, the, the question here is that if we have a free train foundation model, let's say stable diffusion or, or DALI 2, the DALI 3, or EDIFY, and then we have also many downstream tasks that, that we want to solve. So, and then the question is that how could we just use these uh, foundation models to solve downstream tasks in a task agnostic, I mean, universal and controllable function fashion. Task, task, by task agnostic, I mean, we don't need to retrain or fine tune the, the diffusion model or the score function of the diffusion model for each task because you know, a lot of times we don't have the compute for that. You know, a lot of companies or, you know, academics or a lot of places, they cannot train these models from the scratch or they can't even fine tune them. They just want to uh, leverage the prior, the rich prior, prior that they offer. So they, so they wanted to make sure that uh, it works, you know, like by just adjusting the sampling. So the second thing that we want is the controllability. We want to make sure that um, you know we want we can actually have sampling in a way that we want, and we can tune it, so we can tweak the knobs so that we can get desirable properties that we want. I'll, I'll give you examples actually. For example, uh, one of the tasks is uh, you know one of the common tasks is in inverse problems. So inverse problems appear, for example, in image restoration. If let's say if you want to do in painting, we there is an, uh, we have an image, there are objects in that, for example, and we want to remove those objects. And, you know, but we wanted the image also to, you know, look meaningful by just removing the objects from it. Or that that's just one example. There are like tons of other examples. Or even in, in, in 3D rendering, for example, if, or and 3D generation, let's say if you have a parametric model like NERF, like uh, neural radiance fields, and when we have some views uh, of that, and we want to reconstruct the 3D uh, signal from there, so then in, the, in that case, we have, there is a there is a constraint in the sampling because we want to make sure that the render the the output satisfies the renderer requirements. So we can treat it as a constraint. So there are a lot, a lot of other examples that actually we can find that there are constraints in downstream. And then we want to adapt to those actually constraints and changes in a, in a universal way. So in the case of actually inverse problem, the example that I would like to give here in this talk is that we typically have an observation model. Why? 
where it's actually related to x through f of x, and there is a noise added, the noise v, we can assume that it's an IID Gaussian here. And also the function f, which is the forward model, uh, we assume that we know that, and that's actually a nonlinear model. And x, of course, is it, it has a prior. We don't know this specific form of the prior. We don't know p of x, but we know that actually that coming that comes the sample comes from um, you know the prior which has been learned by a pre-trained diffusion model, for example, a stable diffusion or Darley tree. So, and we want to find x. We want to solve for x. So. So methods like Langevin dynamics and MCMC-based methods, uh, they don't work actually here. They cannot take constraints because you know the, the score function, if we have the constraints uh, for sampling, it becomes actually quite time dependent and interactable. So uh, Mustafa, basically you have a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, you see it in the question and answer box. You can click on it if you want. I can read it. Let me also share with you. I can't see it. it. It's better if I actually could read it. So okay, you can click just read, if you want to also see it yourself. You can click on the Q and A box below. But anyway, I'm going to read it. Uh, when you are considering the data at step t and get x t, a mm -hmm. combination of x zero and the noise at epsilon. What is the significance of one of the coefficients, square root of alpha t? Uh, why are you specifically using the square root function? Well, uh, there is no requirement for the square root function here. We just want to make sure that the energy, some of the energy is one, meaning that like uh, if it's some the squares up is, is to one, it's just a normalization. But it, it, it depends on your parameterization. You could define alpha bar and then one minus alpha bar as a con and use the convex combination. You know, there is two regimes of uh, different regimes of like defining the forward process. One of them is called variance preserving. Another one is called variance exploding. This is a variance preserving because you want to make sure that the noise doesn't blow up. It doesn't go to infinity. Any, any more questions there? I can't actually still see the Q&A. I mean, okay, the slide uh, Okay, he, he actually thanks you. He also asked if any combination, any convex combination work, but then you, you, you actually answered it. So yeah, he thanks you. Okay, thanks. Sounds good. So uh, feel free to ask questions if like any part is not clear. So then, uh, yeah, so all right, so we want to use this uh, pre-trained model to solve uh, for x. And uh, and we have also this observation y. So, so th th this is challenging, uh, as I told you, like for MCMC-based methods or like Langevin dynamics methods, because they all require score function. And the score function, if you remember, it was the gradient of log probability. If we have observation, then that score function is the gradient of the posterior, which is probability of x given y, the observation. But this is actually very challenging to obtain. So we can, through the Bayes rule, we can decompose that uh, load probability, gradient of load probability as sum of the likelihood, which is the blue term here, and the prior term, which is the second term. The prior term is easy because actually we get that exactly from the diffusion model. This comes from the stable diffusion. This is actually exactly the score function of the diffusion model because it's pure pure generation. It doesn't have any conditioning or constraint. But the tricky part is the second term, is the first term. And the reason it's, it's complicated because there is a dependence on T. So uh, if you remember the forward process, we started from X0 and we go all the way to XT. And then Y is also a function of X0. So there is no way to go in this graphical model actually from xt uh, to y. So the, and the reason being is if you think of the um, integration, that's a way to actually represent it. We can get p of y given x zero. That's easy. That's Gaussian. But p of x zero given xt is very complicated. This is actually quite challenging. So it's actually pure 
noise initially and at the end is p of x0 which we don't have access so dependence on time and the fact that we don't have access to p of x0 uh, makes it very complicated and time varying so that's why this actually likelihood term is actually very complicated so so to solve this problem what we actually propose is to use variational approximation because we need to resort to some sort of approximation to uh, deal with this uh, complication. And the idea is that, uh, you know, like as in the case of variational inference, uh, we want to approximate the multimodal distribution, P of X0 given Y, uh, with a Gaussian distribution, which is parameterized by mu and sigma. So this is common practice actually in uh, variational inference. But I will show you actually later that it has very nice and uh, interesting implications and it both actually makes nice nice connections with what exists already in the literature or it existed in the past. So, so if you think of this uh, KL term, we can actually uh, reparameter, we, we, we can rewrite this. So the result uh, that we have is that you can actually, uh, we can show that that KL term, the variational approximation term can be written as a decomposition of a reconstruction term and a regularization term, where the regularization term is actually exactly doing a score matching, but it's doing a score matching over the entire diffusion trajectory. By the way, I'm assuming the continuous case here. So that there is integration from zero to T, but it could be, think of, thought of like the, discrete version of that as well. So the interesting thing is that there is a regularization by, by the entire diffusion trajectory through a score matching. That, that, that means that we want the score of uh, function that this blue one that we get, for example, from stable diffusion gets matched with the score of the Gaussian, which depends on the observation at all time steps from zero to T. And uh, if we do actually some uh, proper evading and do some integration by part and apply some uh, tricks here, we can actually, because at the end of the day, we don't also care about necessarily about loss function if you want to solve this. What we care about is actually the gradient of this loss function. That I'll show you, it has actually a very simple form. So we, we can prove that, you know, like, find like a representation for the score matching loss and other uh, representation for that as a Fisher divergence. And then we can show that if in the case that, you know, like we have a delta Dirac function for the variational approximation, let's give the uh, variance for a second. Variance could also be added actually. It's not a big deal, but it's more intuitive to uh, think of the variational approximation when there is, you know, like this Gaussian distribution is just a Dirac, is a delta Dirac. Then in that case, actually under a very simple mild assumptions, we can show that the gradient of the score matching regularization, which is the second term in the previous slide, takes a very simple form. It actually takes a very simple and intuitive form. If skip the expectation and lambda t for a second, that gradient is just epsilon theta minus epsilon. So epsilon theta was the prediction that we have actually for noise. So this is actually the direction. So, and we know epsilon theta because uh, we know we, we get it from stable diffusion, for example, or we get it from Dali tree. And then uh, it's just a denoising function. And then uh, of course we average it out. This is the expected gradient. Uh, and we average it out with respect to time and epsilon over all time steps and all noise realizations. But uh, this is the expected gradient, but for stochastic optimization, we just need one, one sample from this. So from this. So what I wanted to emphasize here is that this is a very simple form. It doesn't uh, actually require any Jacobian or any gradient with respect to epsilon theta. And also it has a very uh, simple form and it's very intuitive. So, but more interesting thing actually is that I'm pretty sure this is reminiscent of uh, regularization by denoising diffusion for a lot of you. Uh, that have worked uh, on solving inverse problems or compressing in the past. So this is exactly 
similar to the gradient of the red regularizer actually in red framework. But of course, it's very different in a sense that in that context, uh, the regularization was deterministic. The inference was deterministic. The in inference was not stochastic. It wasn't. It was not generative. But here, the gradient is actually with respect to or averaged out over all the entire diffusion trajectory. So it's actually generative. So it, it gives the capability to explore the prior and search in the space of the prior. So it gives a diversity and a stochasticity. So another interesting thing actually about this uh, result is that this, you may have seen also the dream fusion. You know, dream fusion was a work that came out of Google last year about text to 3D generation. And actually it got the outstanding best paper award at iClear a few months ago. And this, uh, it, Dream Fusion becomes a special case of actually this uh, regularization by denoising framework. So Dream Fusion is, is doing not, nothing but actual regularization by denoising because it's using exactly or very similar actually gradients as in this proposition. So, and uh, they, they call it their score distillation function or score distillation sampling actually in the context of Dream Fusion. So the, if you summarize the algorithm, this regularization by denoising algorithm, actually we call it red diff regularization by denoising diffusion process, uh, which is a variational sampler. It, it takes very simple form actually. So we just, uh, we can just, because we have an objective function now, now the sampling has become optimization. That's actually the nice thing about it. That's, the, that's what I told you, like we can make it controllable because if formulate an, as an optimization, then we know how to, and we have the interpretation of the regularization, then we know how to tune the parameter and we can use different off the shelf uh, optimizers. So if we have different properties, if for example, we want to have accelerated convergence. So the algorithm is very simple, like through a stochastic optimization, we can take one sample at a time. So one, one of the, choose one of the time steps randomly and choose also a realization of noise randomly. We can form the forward step, which is alpha t, this by the way, the sigma t is one minus alpha t. It's like the like the question that was asked. And uh, so it's again the, the variance preserving scenario. And then the loss function per iteration, which is the instantaneous loss, is nothing but the reconstruction loss at a time, plus a linear term, because there is SG here is refers to a stop gradient, meaning that a gradient doesn't need to go through the score function, which is actually nice. So we can just treat this as a linear term, which is pretty much like the red regularizer. And then we can use take one optimization step, optimizer step to solve the problem, to get mu. So and uh, yeah, so that's about the algorithm. But let me actually show you some you know basic results about you know, like where this algorithm could be used. So as I said, like inverse problems is, is, a, is one typical actually example. And then uh, in painting is actually an important task. That it's actually a very challenging task in inverse problems because there is a lot of ambiguity. And if we tried actually this algorithm, this Rediff algorithm, it, it beats actually state of the arts and it could generate and fill out actually the missing parts by using the prior that it gets from the pre-trained diffusion foundation models. So in this case, we use the guided diffusion model actually as the foundation model, which actually came out from OpenAI also a couple of years ago. So it could be also applied for super resolution in the same way, which is super resolution. It tries to recover fine details or high frequency information. And we found that this model actually gives better PSNR, you know, like, and, uh, it, it has more fidelity with the with the ground truth. So this has also been applied actually by some collaborators that I have at Stanford to a uh, case of MRI reconstruction. And there actually we, we could see that we can uh, reconstruct for you know like different acceleration factors if we use a diffusion pre-trained based on MRI models. This is not based on uh, you know images based on you know, like internet images, this the diffusion score function that we utilized here has been trained actually based on the MRI images. 
So and we could see that we can actually build state of the arts which are using Langevin sampling. So that's uh, because Langevin is actually quite suboptimal when there are constraints. So it's been applied to nonlinear tasks, for example, nonlinear phase retrieval and nonlinear deep layering and you know uh, high dynamic range, which are nonlinear tasks. And then we have observed that you know because of the optimization formulation of that, it, it, it's not sensitive. It's actually quite stable and it actually outperforms state of the arts. But one example that I wanted to show you, which was actually related to uh, dream fusion, which was the work came out of Google last year, which is a special case of that, that actually, because dream fusion was not kind of coming from, it was a, kind of like a, proposed in a more heuristic way that it was working pretty well but we, we, make, we made the connection actually to variational inference. And then that uh, connection and the optimization formulation allowed us to make it more interpretable and actually better, you know, like tune the parameters and uh, design a better sampling strategy that, you know, that could even outperform the infusion, the original dream fusion actually framework. So for text to uh, three D generation using, using NERF. So yeah, that, that's it actually. So, and uh, you know, this is the, let me give you the, the punchlines of the talk that uh, to remember. So the first thing actually that I was trying to advocate for is that generative AI is uh, rapidly revolutionizing how we work with data and applications. NVIDIA is actually at the epicenter of this technology, which is, uh, trying to create an ecosystem for generative AI from software to compute. And uh, especially on the vision side, diffusion models are the core and seem to be very successful. And they come from the actual principles of stochastic differential equations. They've been pretty successful for text to image and text to three generation and text to video generations. And there are more actually works yet to be come for diffusion models. So, and uh, the problem on the sampling side that I, I focused was, uh, let's say if you have foundation models, big foundation models that you know, big companies provide, and then we wanna leverage their reach prior to solve our downstream task. How could we have a task agnostic uh, and plug and play sampler without actually fine tuning or retraining anything to adapt to our downstream task? And then I actually introduced this uh, ready for regularization by denoising framework which actually treats sampling as an optimization and it allows actually controllability and interpretability. And the nice thing was that actually this Rediff was connecting diffusion models to regularization by denoising. So, and of course, regularization by denoise by the entire diffusion process, uh, which actually I think is very important because it connects generation with regularization by denoising, uh, which is actually an implicit prior of denoising. So yeah, that's actually it about the conclusion. So if you are interested, you can actually find the materials online, the papers. And also we had a tutorial, a couple of tutorials actually at CVPR and ICML. The code is also available if you wanna give it a try or if you wanna build on top of that or improve it or develop new algorithms. So, and also I would like to acknowledge actually my colleagues and collaborators that NVIDIA and Stanford. And uh, I also want to encourage uh, new graduates and, uh, you know, like interest, interested, you know, people to, you know, apply for our team fundamental. We are actually quite hiring uh, these days and uh, on, you know, fundamentals of generative AI and, uh, you know, and for applications such as 3D, science, and vision. So we have openings for interns, research scientists, and senior research scientists. You can actually check the details in the careers website and the media, or actually you can just shoot me an email and then I'll, I'll give you details and I can give you referrals. So yeah, that's it. I, you know, like, I, I, thanks for your patience. If there are actually any more questions, I'll be happy to address. Thank you very much. Yeah, this was a great talk.
and I appreciate taking the time and carefully explaining ideas behind the diffusion models for generation. I think it's helpful for a lot of students. Um, yeah, so feel free to uh, write your questions in the questions and answer box. Um, I was already see one question. Do you see now the questions? Actually, I see the questions, but I share my screen, so it's uh, okay. But this is just a to... thank you comment from one of the participants. Okay. okay thanks. Uh, I got it. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, so we'll wait for more people. Um, and after the talk, there will also be a one on one session. Um, with uh, Dr. Madani, I'll share the Zoom link soon. Uh, so, so yeah, until people ask questions, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious, uh, you know, you kind of, you advocate for the diffusion models, but, um, you know, there's still a lot of things to maybe to improve with guns and, you know, guns is still kind of very effective uh, method if, you know, if you, do it in a certain way. So, so what what do you think about the you know gun versus uh, diffusion model? Well, it's actually a good question. You know, a lot of things have been changed uh, from guns to diffusions now. Even at actually Nvidia, which was like uh, you know very focused on guns. So, and that's because uh, you know guns have problems first of all in training because it's a, they they need to play a game. They need to sell solve a non convex game there. So their training is quite unstable. That's the first thing. The second limitation, which actually is the, so, but, but if you compare that with the training of diffusions, training of diffusion is super simple. It's, you know, like super stable because it's just like learning a denoiser. It's just a quadratic least square problem training to solve. Uh, that's the first thing. The se second thing actually, which is more important even is that GAN has mode collapse issue. So if you have a multimodal distribution, it can easily actually collapse into a single mode. But the very nice thing about diffusion is that actually they have pretty good diversity. They don't uh, have that actually mode collapse issue. Right. So, but this is, I think, there's still way to improve ways to improve it. So I don't think, you know, people should give up on this, you know, about ways to maybe enforce a certain type of generator. You know, I, I don't think, you know, it's the end of, you know, I think there are ways maybe to take care of a mode collapse in GAN. Well, right. I think mod collapse is a fundamental limitation there. But right in the current formulation, but I kind of still hope that, you know, if you have some restriction on the generate, you know, on the generator, you know, we kind of have, you know, have a certain properties um, and it's not kind of an arbitrary function, maybe you'll be able to improve things. But yeah, but this is a question. Yeah, it's unclear yet. Okay. Yeah, certainly you can improve steel GANs, but if diffusions can give you that for free, so, and their training is so stable, so why, why not just, and they are interpretable, so why not just using them? So, of course, diffusions also have drawbacks. One drawback is that they're, because their sampling is actually iterative, they, they have uh, slower inference slower sampling, but there, there's been a lot of work actually to distill that using distillation techniques actually to to make sampling like from 100 steps, for example, to just a few steps. So that's one thing. Another thing actually, as I, I think it's also kind of seen from my talk in that diffusions are very easy to deploy because you just need a score function. If you, if I, if you give me the score function, I can solve inverse problems easily. I don't need to retrain for each in, in inverse problem for each specific task. So I just need a, a prior, which comes from stable diffusion. And then I can actually go and deploy that for different inverse problems, for different downstream tasks. But that's also a very neat thing about them is, is that how you deploy them. Okay. okay, thank you. So yeah, there are two questions. I don't know if you can see them. If you see, I made you- Yeah, I can see them. Okay. Yeah, I can see. Let me also share it with other people. So thanks for the talk. Can you please describe the limitation or current challenges of a diffusion model generative AI in general? So you kind of started answering it, but maybe you want to add more. Right. So yeah, one one definite uh, like limitation now is the slow inference. 
So because the generation is iterative, then we need to and, and because we need to add noise very slowly, very gradually, then for the generation, for the backward process, actually, we need to also go back slowly so that we don't mess up the assumption, the Gaussian Gaussianity and, and, and lack, you know, like convergence. So that's but there are a lot of work going on in that direction. That's that's one of the limitations, current limitations. So then um yeah, so I think that so yeah, I think that's maybe that's the that's the main challenge. So about the second question, uh, it's good to read it. So for using generative models on data such as MRI images, which are different from natural images, we need uh, to train uh, such a model from scratch. How much data is needed for this, and is this practical? Yeah, we don't need to train it from the scratch. Like let some institution, let's let's say. Uh, which have computes, they can train a model based on the old MRI data in the world. Actually, there, are, there is a very good MRI data set. It's called Fast MRI, which was collected through a partnership between Facebook and NYU a few years ago. And uh, the checkpoint, for example, that we use the score function was based on a model pre-trained on those data. We, you know, like one, one institution could train that and then everybody can deploy that. So we are not using natural images, we are not using a stable diffusion to solve MRI. It's, it's based on a diffusion model, which has been trained based on MRI data, and that can be deployed for with, with anyone, like uh, for any any kind of MRI inverse problem. Yeah. And he's also asking about data other than MRI. I'm not sure if I understand the question, so. I think you thought different. maybe what you answered was only for MRI. Uh, you know yeah. what? Uh, we, we, we can skip it and he can join you right. in the next session and talk more. Yeah, closely. yeah, we can talk offline about that. So. Uh, yeah, and last question. Uh, what do you think is the next big trend in AI after diffusion models? Well, it's actually very hard to predict <laughs> because in the chart that I showed you, I think diffusion models are still, they need still a few more years to develop and actually get mature. The peak, I guess, uh, in the is not there. The peak wasn't there in the plot actually that I showed you. So it, it is very hard to predict, but uh, if the next big thing, should, I, I guess, try to solve the limitations of diffusion, or it should build on the limitations of diffusion, but one of them is actually the slow inference. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So we're going to have a follow-up, uh, more personal session uh, with Dr. Madani for half an hour. You can also ask about career advice. Um, I put the link in the chat box and you can 